Oliver, we'll now hear from Joe Wendler. Um, good morning. Um, my name is Joseph Wendler. I'm uh, the uh, Director of Standards and Certification Initiatives for ASME. I'd like to also thank FIMSA for hosting this workshop and allowing me to share some of ASME's perspectives. Uh, for those of you who are, are not familiar with the acronyms or want to keep up, ASME is the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. A little bit about us, we were founded in 1880. We published our first standard in 1884, which was a, perform a performance test on steam boilers. And steam power and pressure technology are still very much a part of our core competencies. Today we have over 120,000 members around the world. We have uh, 4,900 volunteers who participate in our standards development activities. Um, interestingly, 700 of our members that write standards are not from the U.S., and this is a trend that we expect to continue to grow uh, significantly. Um, we publish over 550 standards now, everything from fasteners um, to uh, plumbing fixtures to hand tools, up to machines like cranes, elevators, escalators, and power plant equipment, including equipment for nuclear power plants. Um, these are used in over 100 countries, and this reflects not only the the global relevance of ASME standards since they are accepted outside of the U.S., but also the, the fact that technology innovation is not only happening here in the U.S., um, it's, it's, it's being advanced and applied in other, parts of the, in other parts of the world, like oil and gas pipelines being built in India and the Middle East, um, power plants being built in China and, and Korea to, to ASME standards. And so, you know, we look at ASME as a truly global enterprise. Um, our mission has always uh, revolved around improving the quality of life, and so we have a shared interest with FIMSA and other agencies in, in protecting public safety, uh, health, and the environment. Uh, a little bit about our standards developing process. We're also accredited by ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. They have essential requirements and formal procedures that ensure our standards are, are developed in an open, inclusive, and transparent process. Um, these kind of requirements are also mirrored by the World Trade Organization, and they have criteria for, for uh, the development of international standards, and we take these very seriously because we think this adds to the credibility and the relevance of our standards. Um, one of the real uh, key criteria is the balance of our committees. Our, our standards are not written by a group of four individuals or four in, in, uh, organizations with a narrow view. Uh, they're written both by producers, uh, consumers, owners, operators, inspectors, uh, maintenance people, laborers, um, anybody that we can involve in this process, um, we try to solicit to make our standards more robust. And if we do identify an interest class that's not being represented, we do take proactive measures to um, solicit that kind of input. So we, we truly uh, strive to develop relevant standards for every kind of stakeholder possible. Um, another key part of our development process is relevance. Um, our standards are reviewed at least every five years. Most of the ones um, that, are, that are important to industry are reviewed on a continuous basis, and so we receive requests for revisions daily on an uh, on on evolving basis um, for all of our standards, um, most of the ones that are referenced in regulation anyway. Um, and this keeps them technically relevant. It, it, it helps us incorporate lessons learned from people who are having difficulty uh, applying these in practice, and, and it's, it's a good way to, to ensure that, they're, that they take in all the new uh, information out there. Um, another key um, component in, involving the openness and transparency is, is the way we engage the public. We have no fees for participating. All of our meetings are open to the public, all of our agendas are published, and all of our revisions are published in advance. Um, prior to issuing any new publication, we have a public review period similar to a federal rulemaking process where those revisions are all published for free, um, not just to people in the U.S., but all over the world. Anyone can log on and see these revisions, what they are, um, and, and before they're actually published. So there is a lot of openness and transparency in our, pro in our process. Uh, the question that we're getting asked a lot right now is, is why do you charge for your standards? Why do you charge so much for your standards? Um, and simply put, as others have said, creating these standards takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of resources. They don't just drop out of the sky. Um, there, there's quite a few benefits to, to selling the standards. Um, number one, you know, as, as with the principles of the Technology Transfer Act, um, it, it, it prevents the government and taxpayers from having to bear that cost. Um, secondly, um, it, it prevents it from being overly influenced by a group of stakeholders who perhaps pay to have that standard development, whether that's the private sector or the government. Um, 
as, as ASTM noted, you know, having a low or no cost participation model does attract small and medium sized businesses. We recently conducted a survey um, that kind of uh, showed us that 50% of our standards committee volunteers work for organizations with less than 500 employees and 20% work for organizations with less than 10 employees. So we think this is really effective at getting small and medium sized businesses a seat at the table and having the ability to influence the ultimate rules that affect their business. Um, and lastly, by, um, by um, funding standards development through the sale of standards, it spreads the costs out amongst industries, amongst stakeholders who ultimately benefit from, from the use of those standards. Um, in terms of how ASME is impacted, we're, we're very much impacted. I think the current uh, Office of Pipeline Safety Regulations reference 60 or so standards. Uh, they incorporate 60 or so standards by reference. 11 of those are ASME standards. Um, several of those are very germane to the pipeline um, community, the B31 uh, standards. Several other ones, um, as was noted by NIST, are the boiler and pressure vessel code, which span well beyond uh, pipeline and the oil and gas industry are used in things like hospitals and schools and power plants. And so, um, you know, it expands beyond just the, the scope of, of pipeline safety. Um, in terms of our position with the Section 24 of the Pipeline Safety Act, um, once this was put out, ASME uh, led a coalition of nine standards developers. And uh, we submitted letters to both the Senate and the House of Representatives requesting repeal of this provision. Um, we also sent a letter to the DOT advising them of our concerns, and I'll share some of those concerns with you in a bit. But, um, you know, our main, our main um, problem is essentially this is forces ASME to do one of two things, either um, tell FEMSA not to reference our standards, in which case we'd kind of be impeding them from uh, accomplishing their very um, necessary public safety mission or we'd be forced to put our standards online for free and roll the dice with how long we can actually stay in business, one year, two years, whatever, and then who's going to fill this void and how. And so it was really a no-win situation for us, and so we were you know, really compelled to action. Um, our rationale for, for some of this was included in the letter. Um, as others have said, you know, the, the specific um, policy, it doesn't align with OMB A119, it doesn't align with the Tran Transfer uh, Technology Advancement Act. Um, both of those kind of point to the government agencies to continue to look to the private sector for standards development. Um, and, and interestingly, there was a lot of concurrent review of the existing policies by other parts of government, and, and they expressed the collective understanding that access and availability on a reasonable basis may include monetary compensation. So ASME, you know, underscored those things in its letters um, to Congress. We also outlined some of the potential negative um, repercussions of implementing this as we move forward. Um, you know, if ASME were to, and other SDOs were to withhold its standards from being referenced, what you might see is a divergence in the industry practice and what the regulations um, are set out to do. And so, you know, this divergence is, is what the policies are intended to prevent. Um, you might see reduced responsiveness from federal agencies. As it is now, a lot of agencies aren't consistent and are you know, overwhelmed with just updating the references that are existing um, to more recent um, versions and doing the due diligence and reviewing the content of the standard. If you also task them with developing standards on top of that, um, you might see you know, a very lag in terms of, of what the private sector is learning and, and what is being um, up, up, uptaken by uh, federal agencies. Um, another concern is reduced stakeholder diversity. Who's ultimately going to bear the cost of those standards? Are small businesses going to be able to participate? Um, is the government going to be able to sustain some kind of standard where they do have uh, a dedicated group of volunteers who, who contribute on a sustainable basis? Um, along with, um, you know, a divergence in industry practice and regulations, you know, you, you kind of create confusion because businesses don't know, do I comply with the private sector latest standard or do I comply with the regulation that might be 10 or 20 years old? And so you have this divergence and that kind of creates confusion. And when you have that confusion, businesses and people are put in a choice where, you know, they don't know what to follow and that creates risk for people, safety, the environment. And, uh, and it also creates burdens on businesses who are forced to comply with competing um, frameworks for compliance. Um, this doesn't apply just to Office of Pipeline Safety and Regulations. Anytime you have a business that's forced to comply with more than one standard, it, uh, they have to bear the cost of complying with two different frameworks. 
Um, just some final thoughts um, from ASME moving forward. I'm, ASME is definitely open to, you know, new ways of, of increasing transparency of what's in its standards, but um, um, we, we want to underscore that we feel the ex issue of accessibility and reasonable availability is separate from the issue of cost. Our standards are very accessible. Um, they're published online. We sell them through resellers. Um, we, we support many of the ACUS recommendations, specifically the one that says consideration should be given to the types of parties that need access to material and their ability to, build, to bear the cost of accessing such materials. And lastly, um, I think in the OFR petition that was submitted um, several months ago, there was a proposal that some central agency serve as a clearinghouse to kind of arbitrate what is reasonably available. And ASME supports that kind of determination if one is needed to, to reside within the agencies who are closest to industry, who understand the standards, the complexity of the process, and the value that it presents to the people who, who need the standard. So um, that concludes my comments, and thank you.